Welcome everyone, I'm John Haber, and I'm ex Executive Secretary of New York Carolina Club. Uh, going back in time uh, 52 years ago, um, on February 28th, uh, I got to introduce Janis Joplin at Carmichael. I was president of the Carolina Union, so I, I got that privilege. Um, I didn't really get to interact with her, but I remember her sauntering onto the stage, holding on to that bottle of Southern Comfort. <laughs> oh. And it, it was a legendary night uh, in Chapel Hill. And uh, here we are tonight, and uh, I have the privilege to introduce Holly and uh, the moderator, who's another uh, alum. I'm going to first tell you a little bit about Holly, Holly George Warren, class of 78. She's a two-time Grammy nominee and award-winning author of 16 books, including Janice, Her Life and Music, named Best Nonfiction Book of 2019 by the Texas Institute of Letters. Holly received her first Grammy nomination for Best Historical Recording in 2001 for co-producing Rhino's five CD box set, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, A Century of Women in Music. She also produced the three CD set, the Rolling Stone Woman, Women in Rock collection, a series of CDs with uh, the Lifetime Network and a Wanda Jackson tribute album, Hard Headed Woman for Bloodshot Records. In addition, she has served as an archivist curator for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Foundation and the Grammy <laughs> Museum. Um, she served as director of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame oral history program for several years and as a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominating committee. She received her second Grammy nomination in 2013 for penning the liner notes to Janis Joplin's The Pearl Session. Uh, Holly has also served as producer or consulting producer to several documentary films, including Emmy nominated Woodstock Now and Then and Welcome to the Club, The Women of Rockabilly, Hitmakers, Nashville 2.0, and the Sundance entry Muscle Shoals. She's currently collaborating on a documentary, Rhinestone Cowboy. And we're uh, blessed to have a commentating tonight, uh, Mark. Peter Baugh, uh, UNC class of 76, but then he came back and got a master's in 96. Um, Park has been writing sh about music for 40 years, has published in three dozen magazines and newspapers. He's a former senior editor at Rolling Stone and has contributed exhibit copywriting, inductive biographies and other forms of writing to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since its inception. Uh, and Park has taught courses on the history of rock and popular music at Guilford College. Uh, he's with us from Greensboro tonight for the past 15 years. Currently he's working on his 10th book, a study of the subculture of beach music and shag dancing in the Southeast. So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys and uh, so glad everyone's here. And here we go. Yeah. Awesome. Well, here's the book we're talking about. A really wonderful book. Right off the bat, Holly, I just wanted to tell you, um, I really appreciated the fact that your book presented a picture of Janice as a whole person. It's one of the main things I got out of it. And I came away from it feeling like her life was as interesting as her music. Mm, thank you. Was that uh, one of your intentions in writing the book? Yeah, definitely, Park. Um, you know, growing up in Asheboro, North Carolina, we didn't have a lot of rock and roll happening at that time. But um, I did see her on the Dick Cavett show as a you know young girl right at that age where, oh my gosh, what is this? How come there's nothing like this in Asheboro? You know, of course, I hadn't been to Chapel Hill yet. But um, 
Then, of course, I got Pearl, um, sadly, after she died in 1971. It just came out, you know, 50 years ago, this past January. And um, and then, of course, I immediately was a huge fan, and it, it really spoke to me. I was at that age where um, Janice's angst um, really hit me. I was also kind of getting into country rock, and there was elements of that in there, as well as her other styles. I mean, a lot of different styles of music and her intellect and personality was already kind of coming across to me. Then I read the first biography of Janice by Myra Friedman, who had been her publicist um, for Albert Grossman, her manager, who of course also managed Bob Dylan. And the picture of Janice in that book really stuck with me and it was very depressing. It was this woman who was vastly talented, you know, there was no doubt about that incredible voice of hers. But she came across in the book as just this kind of self-destructive, tortured victim who kind of, you know, hit hit it big and then just went on this downward spiral. And, you know, looking over the years through different, um, you know, publications, whenever I could, I'd read something about Janice. There was a, actually a really good piece that was much more affirmative in the Rolling Stone Illustrated History of Rock and Roll. Um, which was published, I think, um, in the late 70s. And then interestingly, that was by Ellen Willis, a woman who uh, reviewed Janice, was one of the first female journalists um, that wrote about music, wrote, was the staff writer about music for The New Yorker, this incredible pioneering female writer. And when I started working at Rolling Stone, where Park was, um, in the 80s, after I moved to New York, I, you know, was reading back, you know, issues and articles about her. And still, I wasn't able to really get that much information about Janice, the musician, Janice, this powerful person who, wait a minute, if she went from the small town, Port Arthur, Texas, to the queen of the counterculture in, in San Francisco, and then the queen of rock, you know, all globally, how did she do that? Um, she had to have a lot more than I really was led to believe from what I'd read about her. And then fortunately, um, you know, as Park has been involved in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I luckily got to start um, doing some things with the Hall of Fame when it started while I was at Rolling Stone and they had a conference about Janice. They had two of them, one in the 90s and one in the aughts. And by going to those, and I was fortunately asked to be a presenter at these conferences, I got to actually meet some of Janice's peers, the guys from her band, her old friends, um, the guys she played in a little group with in Austin, Texas, you know, in 1961. And this uh, gradually I'm getting this whole idea of Janice as much more than what I'd read about in um, Myra's book and some other books. And then also um, the other big uh, light bulb moment was when uh, Sony Music asked me to write those liner notes for the Pearl Sessions. And what was cool about that was that they had gone into the vault and pulled out all these tapes of Janice in the studio with Paul Rothschild, the producer of Pearl, who I knew from being, I, he'd passed away before I came on the scene to start interviewing people, but I'd just done some notes for a big uh, Doors set. So I'd interviewed the guys in the Doors and they were talking about a, what, what a taskmaster he was as a producer and how he would make Jim Morrison do his vocals like 17 times and, and all this stuff. And then I listened to these tapes that I got from Sony for writing the notes. And I'm listening to Janis Joplin calling the shots, you know, and Paul Rocha went, Janice, yeah, that's a great idea. And she's like, yeah, wait, let's do a guitar part here. Let's slow down the tempo there. I mean, this woman is acting as a producer in the studio, which in 1970, when they were making that record was unheard of. I don't know if anybody has, you know, seen other, you know, the Aretha Genius series that was recently on. Aretha's trying to produce her records and Jerry Wexler's like, no, you know, the artist doesn't produce their records. Women don't produce their records. And Janice was on her way to becoming a producer. So that's really, you know, learning this kind of information and really wanting to paint this much more multi-textured, you know, picture of Janice was definitely in the forefront of my goal for that book. Yeah, um, which reminds me, uh, there's a quote in your book from Newsweek where it called Janice the first female superstar of rock music. 
is that true do you believe that's true um well if you if you're going to you know it's it's kind of weird i mean and i'm so happy what happened to not to get all political but i'm just so happy what happened in minneapolis today um but you know if you want to talk about coded words you know rock was kind of the coded word for white um, you know, Aretha Franklin was the queen of soul, which is the coded word for black music. So if we want to horribly what we have done and what the music business has always done separated out by color, um, I would say, yes, yeah, she was definitely the biggest, um, you know, female rock star of her day. You know, Aretha was, I mean, Aretha was a huge role model for Janice. She was obsessed with, the, with Aretha. She loved black music. She also loved Tina Turner. I don't know if anybody's seen the HBO doc, but um, Janice was, I, there's this great clip of Janice on Dick Cavett raving about Tina Turner. And he has this kind of, you know, befuddled look on his face, like, who was that again? You know, she's like, oh my God, you know. And I mean, she worshiped these women of color who she thought were the real queens. And for Janice, she was always, of course, she had an ego, you know, she was a star and she wanted to be a star. She was ambitious, but I don't think she would have, she wouldn't have been comfortable, I think, calling herself that, but she was very happy for Newsweek to do that. So all those morons back in Port Arthur, Texas could see her being called that. And these are people that castigated her for loving black music, for standing up in school after Brown versus the Board of Education in favor of integration and integrating schools in Texas, which didn't happen for another like 10 years, by the way. And she, that's when she wrecked her reputation was because of she wanted to cross those color boundaries in a very segregated town, segregated time. Yeah, I was, uh, you made a reference to the sisterhood of song. Um, and there are all these iconic, um, Black soul and R and B singers, and uh, Odetta being a major one for her from the get go, and also Etta James and Billie Holiday and uh, Tina Turner, of course, and the Simone. Ma and don't Ray. forget Bessie Smith. She Bessie was Smith. obsessed with Bessie Smith, and she discovered right. Bessie in Port Arthur. And when she went to college in Beaumont, Texas, and this was, you know, Bessie was pretty much forgotten at this point. You know, we're talking late 50s 1960 and um janice sought out you know she wrote a well wrote away mail order for bessie smith records and literally was obsessed with her would listen to those records over and over um and that's how she worked to change her own singing was through listening to lead belly to bessie smith to odetta she had a beautiful soprano voice she sang in the choir she was in the glee club in school but she realized she could do things with her voice that she never thought about before. She had never really heard that kind of music before. And so um, she would literally just study those records and all the way up until 1963, when she first went to San Francisco, hitchhiking from Austin to try to make it as basically a Bessie Smith style blues singer on the coffee house circuit. And that's where she first met Yorma Kalkinen who accompanied her on some gigs. She first met Jerry Garcia. Everyone that she met was blown away by this you know, white girl from Texas who sounded black and, you know, could sing it not as um, like someone trying to appropriate the music, but someone who loved it with all of her heart and it really spoke to her. And she kind of channeled all this music that she loved and it kind of came out as Janice, but it was um, very different from what most um, white, you know, folk singers were doing at that time. Yeah, true. And she not only loved the music, she, research the music she had an encyclopedic knowledge of the music what was yeah. it about her and bessie smith in particular why was she such a towering influence above all others um it's interesting because um again like you said she was a real bookworm and a scholar and would read and learn about people and she read billy holiday's um you know so-called memoir 
She was another big fan. She was a big fan of her music too. When it came to Bessie, I think she somehow identified with her persona as well as her music. Uh, Janice was bisexual um, and so was Bessie Smith. I don't know if she somehow picked up on that. Bessie Smith projected both power and passion and um, but she also projected, uh, you know, some vulnerability. She uh, wasn't afraid to sing um, songs about being totally stomped all over and mistreated. But then she would also sing songs that were much more like, re you know, revenge. She was going to get them back. And even though, um, you know, you saw these both sides of her, her strength really came through. And the way that she, I think, sang her lyrics as if she had really, you know, lived the, the lives that she was singing about and felt those emotions she was uh, singing about. And, and that's what Janice wanted to do. That was her aspiration was to be able to do that. Uh, and also Janice paid it back, literally. I mean, didn't she... Um buy a headstone for Bessie Smith's unmarked yeah, grave. Yeah, she did. Yeah, and it, it was really cool. I was able to find, um, sadly, this writer passed away. I wish I could have met him not too long ago, who wrote the first um, really great Bessie Smith biography. And Janice was able to meet him. And there's this great description he did, like in a revised version of his um, book, the revised edition, where he described getting together with Janice at Columbia and getting, because, you know, cool, Janice got to be on the label that her idol Bessie Smith was on and of course she was the empress of the blues and one of the biggest selling artists on Columbia Records um, back in the day and so they got to listen to all these things that were in the vault there together and she just talked so much about how much she loved her and so not only did she buy she and a nurse from the Philadelphia area chipped in together and bought a headstone for Bessie Smith's grave which didn't have one um, she's buried outside of Philadelphia but even more cool I think um, and the guy you know who wrote this book told about this was she had this idea of setting up a scholarship in Bessie Smith's name to um, help finance uh, music education for young uh, uh, people of color who wanted to further their education. Now, horribly, all this went down only, I think it was about six weeks before Janice's untimely death yeah. in October of 1970. So that never came to fruition. Now, uh, is this Chris Albertson you're talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked with him at Stereo Review. He was a reviewer. Oh, you're reviewer. kidding. No, oh uh, my God, Park, no. I never knew that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I really, I, I wish I could have met. And I wonder what happened to all of his Bessie Smith files and research. Hmm. Because I actually did meet someone that knew Chris Albertson and said it was all crammed in his small apartment in New York. So I don't, you well, know, being a, yeah, being a former someone. archivist for the Rock and Roll Hall of Good. Fame, I'm wondering what happened to all that stuff, you know? Goodness gracious, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, in terms of your writing of the book, how long did it take you? Um, did you run into any roadblocks? Um, I'm, I'm very interested in process as a writer uh, myself, <laughs> trying to figure well, out how people do yeah. it. You wouldn't know anything about procrastinating or anything like that, right? <laughs> Well, as you know, Park, uh, I think you're a little bit like me. I love the research process. I could just, I could mm -hmm. still be researching that book right now, mm -hmm. but thank goodness for uh, deadlines and editors that with a, you know, uh, a firm hand that try to force you to turn in your work. Um, but, you know, like I said, I didn't know I was working on the book for years uh, before I actually got the book deal. Mm -hmm. And it was just literally my quest for information, my love of Janice's music. Um, so I'd done some research just over the years and I'd written some other liner notes about Janice and et cetera. But when I got the book deal, um, I really started working on it in January of 2015 and altogether, I guess, worked on it about four years. You oh. know, um, my process is I, I tried to do as much of the research as I can, um, as chronologically as possible, because obviously you, but you want to talk to the people that are getting up there in age and horribly, 
over the course of my book, you know, we lost quite a few people that I interviewed. Um, so I feel so thankful that I did get to interview them before they died horribly. Um, I did luckily get to meet and hang out with Sam Andrew, her guitar player from Big mm -hmm. Brother, who she was very tight with um, back when I did the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame um, conference. And he was there and we really hit it off and spent time together. And I learned a lot from him then, but I didn't know I was gonna be writing a book about Janice. But um, sadly, he died right as I was getting started on the book. But fortunately, thanks to our many friends, um, music journalists who want to share the wealth, um, I was able to get interview transcripts from a lot of music journalists I know who did get to interview some of the people that had passed away. And um, I did, uh, my agent made a deal with uh, the Joplin estate for me in which they would provide me carte blanche to all of their files, all of Janice's scrapbooks, letters that they had, all the family archives. And in addition to that, Laura Joplin, Janice's sister, who's fortunately still with us, um, had done a memoir back. Um, she started working on it in the 80s and it came out um, in the early 90s. And so she had interviewed a ton of people from their hometown in Port Arthur, Texas, as well as others um, in the music business. And many of those people, including Paul Rothschild, had passed away. And she, as part of our agreement, gave me all the transcripts. Um, wow. Now, they, the good news is my, I did the similar deal with the Gene Autry estate. And I, they have no control over what I write. Um, it's, my manuscript is completely independent of the estate's tinkering. So um, that's, that's mandatory for these kind of agreements. But so fortunately, I was able to get tons of great stuff. And um, the estate also put me in touch with, you know, friends of Janice's, etc. So I did a lot of traveling. I spent a lot of time in Texas and San Francisco, primarily also in Los Angeles. Thanks to my dear friend Mary, who's out Arthur. there, who put me up. <laughs> uh, what were your impressions of Port Arthur seeing it cold? Um, oh, gosh. Well, you know, it's Port Arthur is just a sad um, what happened to it. When Janice was growing up there, it was this booming oil town, super prosperous. And um, so I got to actually see some home movies um, shot of during her childhood and high school year, you know, where they had these parades, all the oil companies um, going through the streets and they had fancy department stores and fancy hotels. They still have this incredible library there, beautiful, that was built by one of the founders in the early 1900s of the town. And um, Janice spent her childhood, a lot of time at that library. Her father used to take her there every Saturday when she was about beginning at age five. But by the time I got there, um, it was, you know, it's been just mercilessly hit by both mother nature with horrible, horrible hurricane and damage, and then all, a lot of economic problems as well. So uh, the town has been um, just really just strafed by all of this. Now, um, the good news is, is that Janice had a very difficult relationship with her hometown. She bad mouthed it. And if anybody has read my book um, or seen maybe the, um, you know, the documentary about Janice, Little Girl Blue, you know, there's this horrible thing that happened when she went back for her high school reunion, her 10th annual high school reu reunion about six weeks before she died. And it was just pretty much a disaster. And she kind of bad mouthed the town on Dick Cavett before she went and all this stuff. But when I went back to Port Arthur um, just about a year ago, it was right before I came to North Carolina and I got to see Park and Stephanie, everybody on my book tour. Um, I was in Port Arthur and Janice's brother, Michael, who now lives in Arizona and joined me there. There's a very cool museum of the Gulf Coast there because there's some other luminaries from there as well. Robert Rauschenberg, the great artist and you know many others. But anyway, it was so amazing park. Um, I think I might even talked about it when I came to Greensboro back, you no. know, last year, there was a line around the block, hundreds of people came out to get their book signed, they bought the book came to get it signed by Michael and me and it was like a rainbow just or a bouquet of people as they were saying today from Minneapolis. Um, people of all you know people from Janice's you know parent who knew the parents who were in their late 90s literally who were in there to uh, young people with their kids who they named them Janice 
to people, you know, of every color, brown, black, white, you know, um, every, there was trans people there, lesbian couples, gay couple, you know, it was just, it was so cool. And they all loved Janis Joplin. So I just felt really great about that. Um, and I just felt like Janice would have been so pleased because I think she loved her hometown. Mm. She loved growing up there. But once she, you know, got to be a teenager and realized the reality of bigotry and segregation and racism and homophobia and all these things that she encountered that made it problematic for her, you know, that's what caused the difficulties. And I think she would have been so happy to see this embrace of um of her and her music at the town and the museum has a really great exhibition on janice there and everybody was so supportive so there's you know and i, I just hope the best for that town um there are some investors i think that are trying to buy up some of the um area that used to be beautiful that got pretty much demolished by hurricanes so i'm hoping somehow that town will have a comeback and beaumont's a very cool town right next door as well well as long as you brought up the uh, disastrous high school reunion trip. There's one question I had to ask you. In, in your book, um, you quote her mother is saying to her at the end of the weekend, I wish you'd never been born. Now, did they ever talk after that? Um, they did talk, uh, it was chilly. Um, it was phone calls. Um, I don't think there were ever any other letters. You know, at this point, Janice was so successful. I think mostly she was calling on the phone mm -hmm. rather than writing these incredible letters that she started writing home beginning in 66 when she first uh, joined Big Brother and the Holding Company. But, um, you know, they did talk, but I, I think it was just... Um, it's, it's really sad what happened. Um, Janice was always wanting her family's approval. And um, she did not like getting criticized by them, but at the same time, she wasn't going to, you know, uh, buckle, you know, buckle her, or, you know, not say what she wanted to say, you know? And um, so, yeah, conflicts happened like that. But um, I think her father also was just, I mean, they were just so brokenhearted. But the interesting thing is, Park, believe it or not, this is so weird. Again, you know, you never know when you're gathering information for a book 20 years later or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was at this club in Asbury Park with my husband, who's a musician, back in the late 80s, hanging out while he was doing soundcheck and started talking to this young guy who was kind of a gay guy, maybe a touch trans. I don't know really what his deal was. But he loved Janis Joplin. Somehow we started talking about her. And he had traveled to Port Arthur. He was such a fan, knocked on the family home's door and had, was welcomed in by Mr. and Mrs. Joplin and spent a whole day with Dorothy Joplin, the mother, who kind of became almost like the president of the Janice fan club after she died. Um, she would write, she would write the fans back. She would invite people in. And um, the family eventually left Port Arthur and moved to um, Arizona. But to Prescott actually. And, but she would still continue to welcome people in and just uh, wanted to keep her daughter's memory alive. And uh, I got to see a lot of the letters, the correspondence between her and the fans. And it was really, you know, heartwarming. And in fact, at the very end of that um, Amy Berg film, A Little Girl Blue, there's a little, after the end of the credits, there's a little thing of um, Dorothy Joplin talking about Janice and stuff, you know, so mm. later. That is cool. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the music. There is really, there is, in terms of what people are aware of, there is that four year period you talk about, June 66 to her death in October 70. Four years. Everything people know and hear happened in that little time period. And there's essentially four albums, two by Big Brother, one of which is really not very good. And there's not an awful lot of jam. I disagree on. with what the cosmic blues. No, no. The first oh, okay. mainstream big brother album. Oh, oh, the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is a funny record. I mean, I think it has a certain charm now, but yeah, it's you definitely before Janice became, you know, the leader of the band and the, and the um, spotlight of the band, you know, all the other guys, she only sang lead on, I think two yeah. songs. On that. Yeah. It's a 22 yeah. minute album. And yeah. she sings on a handful of songs. 
but of course she that's how the band was in the beginning she was just one of the band members so you know Mm -hmm. But Cheap Thrills is really where it comes to life. And Mm -hmm. I'd like you to talk about that record a little bit, because when you listen to it, it almost creates the illusion that you're in the Avalon ballroom hearing Big Brother play. Yeah. But that is an illusion. It was all done at sound stages in recording studios. Yeah, they uh, they wanted to make a live album. But of course they were on Columbia records and perfection was the name of the game when it came to Columbia and um, Albert Grossman, for whatever reason, probably we won't get into that, but he selected John Simon as their producer. Now, John is an amazing musician. He's got perfect pitch, trained musician, had been a staff producer at Columbia, uh, produced like the first um, Leonard Cohen album, produced the famously the band, um, et cetera. So he did not like Big Brother. He thought they were sloppy. Uh, he didn't think they were had enough precision as musicians. And it's the age old, you know, feel versus technique kind of argument. And they, you know, but Janice had it both. She had the feel and she had the technique. She was the consummate musician. So, you know, she started kind of like getting into that head that he was in like well they have to play everything perfectly it's up for a record it's not like the live show so they literally did try to record a live album at the grand day ballroom in detroit and just everything went wrong and it wasn't good recordings and so um they wanted that live feel though because that was really how the band became successful was playing in those psychedelic ballrooms where the audience and the band just kind of merged. And it was very different from a formal, you know, seated in a theater audience with the artists up on stage. Janice and the band hated that. But unfortunately, um, you know, it's kind of psychological. I think the poor band um, got so defensive and so insecure by being browbeaten by John Simon and, you know, it made them mess up even more. And Janice, of course, she could just hit the notes and be perfect every time. She was amazing. So finally, um, because of John Simon and some others that worked on that album, engineers, et cetera, they were literally able to, you know, piece together tons and tons of recordings to make these complete songs and still give it kind of a live feel. And then they did little, you know, tricks. So for example, for Turtle Blues, um, which is a song Janice actually wrote back in 1965 when she was back home in Texas after her first little stint out in San Francisco, um, she was um, singing this blues song. She got John Simon against his will to play this kind of bluesy barrel house piano. And then Peter Album, the bass player played acoustic guitar, but then her buddy, Bobby Newworth and John Cook, her road manager, they went to their hangout in LA, Barney's Beanery and you know recorded people like talking and smashing glass and doing all this kind of stuff to make it sound live, which was, you know, fake. And then uh, there is one live track, um, their version of Ball and Chain, which was their masterful breakthrough song when they did that at Monterey Pop live um, in 67. So that one was cut at the Fillmore in San Francisco. So um, they did have that one, but, you know, they did a misleading little, I think on the cover, it says something like recorded live. So a lot of people did think it was a live record. And uh, I think it's one of the great documents of the San Francisco era, that, that sound and that, that era. Yeah. And, as, and uh, there was a lot of pressure put on her to separate from the band. And it was coming from Albert Grossman and it was, you know, uh, I guess other sources as well were yeah, trying Clive to pry Davis, her yeah. apart. Clive told me, I got to interview Clive and um, he said that he never put any pressure to separate from, you know, the ban on Janice, but um, he knew that was coming from Grossman pretty much, you know, pretty early on. And again, I mean, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Um, Albert Grossman was a man that did not mince words. He did not, <laughs> he did not uh, try to pack it, pat you on the back if he didn't feel like you deserved it. And I mean, one story that just broke my heart was they were all so excited to play at Newport 
um, you know, festival and folk festival. And, you know, Janice had been wanting to go there since it started in 61. They were so excited. And I mean, there's a lot, I've heard bootlegs of their performance and they, you know, they hit some bad notes here and there, but, you know, overall it had a good, was good. And Grossman was there. He helped start the folk festival actually. <clears throat> so he was there with, I think it was Rick Danko and Levon Helm. So the guys, they get off stage and it was like sold out like 60,000 people. And it was just this, they were, they go backstage or whatever. And they're like, Oh man, wasn't it great? And he's like, Nope, the rhythm section was really bad. You guys are really off. And like, there's, you know, the great rhythm section of the band standing there. So they were just like, oh, horrified. And it was after that show when uh, Janice decided that she was going to leave the band and go solo and broke oh. the news to the guys at the Chelsea Hotel soon after that. And I was amazed to read in your book that they broke up before Cheap Thrills came out. Yeah. I mean, if she had told them she was and going to two. leave before she thrills came out. Yeah, yeah. She, like I said, she couldn't lie. She was one of those people. She, it was, uh, you know, she had to be honest and authentic and she couldn't hide it from the guys. And she loved those guys. I mean, she loved them. It really broke her heart uh, to do that. But you know what? It's not just the pressure uh, coming from Grossman um, and others, you know, the press started like, you know, crucifying the band and stuff. It wasn't really that so much as the fact that Janice was a restless soul. She was a restless artist. Mm -hmm. She was always wanting to do more, do better. And she had fallen madly in love. Like I said, she loved Aretha. She loved Otis Redding. She wanted that Memphis Muscle Shoals sound. And, you know, these guys aren't going to have, you know, keyboards, Hammond B3 organ and horn section and all that stuff. I mean, that's not what Big Brother and the Holding Company were all about. So she would have, even if they had been perfect musicians and played everything like perfectly, I think she would have eventually, you know, left the band. And then she ended up, she did that cause what was later called the Cosmic Blues Band. Um, and actually played the biggest shows and the most, um, you know, high profile gigs of her life, and all the TV stuff and everything. But then she ends up breaking up that band. And then finally in her, you know, last year of life, getting the Full Tilt Bo Boogie Band, which had kind of the vibe of the family kind of guy vibe of Big Brother. But, you know, these guys were kind of, a lot of them cut their teeth in Canada playing in the Ronnie Hawkins, the band uh, who the band started with. So they were really good musicians. They had a good feel, but they were also really tight, you know, and they didn't rebel against her. That was the other problem. You know, Big Brother, that was their band. That band started in 1965. Janice was just like another member when she was, you know, brought it on board. And then she just kind of took over every, the, you know, the audience is just galvanized towards her because she was so incredible. And, her talent was just, you know, it was what it was. And they knew that, but, you know, there was some jealousies and, you know, the dude didn't like the chick telling him what to do, you know? <laughs> so, you know, they started having some issues there. So, and then even with the cosmic blues band, there was like a combination of session players along with um, other guys from the scene and same kind of thing. They didn't like being bossed around by this woman, you know, that's, part of it and then fortunately by the time she got uh, the full tail boogie eyes they loved her they respected her mm -hmm. they knew what she was and they were going to listen to her but she also worked with them you know in a very kind of comrade type way as well so it, it worked out well and it probably also helped that they unlike big brother didn't have heroin coursing through their veins yeah and well, heroin and cosmic blues, there was heroin in both of those groups. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. These guys were kind of fresh faced kind of guys um, in full tilt boogie. They were very clean cut. Um, you know, some of them didn't even hardly drink, but, you know, <laughs> I think by the end they were all drinking, but, um, <laughs> you know, but they were pretty clean cut compared, you know, there were these small town Canadian dudes, most mm. of them. Mm. Um, the biggest shock of realization that I had reading the book was on page 24, um, you, you 
note that everything changed for Jana Scoplin at age 14, page 24, not even 10% through the book. I realized her life was more than half over at that point. That was startling. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's the thing too, because she accomplished so much in her brief life, people forget she was only 27 years old when she died. Think about it, everybody. What were you doing when you were 27? You were probably, well, at least I know I was. I was living in New York, going out every night, staying out all night, playing in bands, you know, um, having a good old time and, you know, thinking I was immortal, sowing my oats and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I had a career idea in the back of my head, but I was very, you know, happy to put it on hold while I just kind of experienced life and played in guitar and all girl bands and toured and all that stuff, you know? So same thing with Janice. And, and I mean, I believe there's even studies that show, you know, your brain that doesn't fully form to make clear decisions until, you know, you're in your late twenties or something. I don't quote me on that, but, um, but still, yeah, she, she made some, you know, bad choices, but one thing I did want to say about her in the book was she was not a victim though. She knew she was living a dangerous life. Uh, just like a cowgirl that's breaking horses or in a rodeo, you know, you can die. You can die from taking drugs. A lot of, you know, Jimi Hendrix died just, you know, a couple of weeks before Janice did uh, of an overdose. And, um, you know, and it's weird. Other people did too, that she knew. So, she knew she was risking her life. She was of the headset that she, you know, it was part of that whole idea of you have to put yourself out there. You have to live in danger. You have to experiment. You have to have these adventures in order to be able to be the artist that you want to be, to be authentic. And unfortunately, addiction is such that, um, you know, you can't just play around with it. And with, with Janice, I you know, what's so tragic, it's kind of, I mean, it's still being born out today with the whole, you know, the fentanyl epidemic. Um, you know, she was basically, she had had a heroin addiction in 1969, but she was pretty much off of that um, by the time she died. She'd been clean for about five months. So um, she got some heroin, made a stupid decision to get some to kind of chill out while she was in the recording studio. And it was super, super pure. I think like eight people overdosed that same weekend on the same batch. And um, in the meantime, she was definitely an alcoholic. And one reason she turned to heroin and while she was recording is that in reality, alcohol is much worse on the vocal cords and, and singing than heroin is. And she was really trying to cut back on her drinking. And that was a really bad way to do it. And it killed her. But yeah, by 14, you know, yeah, it's, it's crazy to think that her life was half over then. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talk a lot of, of, about her promiscuity. She was, you know, she had a very active sexual lifestyle with many different partners. Was her promiscuity a reflection of her deep emotional neediness or did she just like having sex a lot? Well, I think she, you know, like Courtney Love said, she, you know, what was the one about the girl with the big cake or something? You know, she wanted to eat all the cake. Um, you know, she had been denigrated, made fun of, called ugly, nominated as the ugliest man on campus when she was at UT and, and performing publicly for the first time with a little bluegrass group, the Waller Creek Boys. She'd had so much hurt thrown at her. Um, she was very insecure about her looks and her uh, sexuality um, or her, not her sexuality, but her, um, you know, that, that she was uh, desirable, I guess you could say. Um, and so she loved getting attention. She loved having, you know, men and women fall all over her and give her attention. And, you know, uh, with the counterculture being what it was and remember free love guys, you know, that was all part of the thing, you know? And of course, also she was a huge fan of On the Road, Jack Kerouac's novel where, you know, the protagonists are traveling around and having sex with all these people all over the place. And, um, you know, all these books that she read that, 
you know, she was a bohemian. She wanted that lifestyle and she was a very sensual person. She was a very physical, athletic person. Um, you know, when you see her on stage, she was magnificent and she was so sexual and sensual that, you know, literally people are like screaming like, Janice, I want to back you, you know, or, you know, no, I want to ball you, I guess was the, was the <laughs> lingo back in those days. Um, so, hey, you know, when the cute ones came around, um, she would take them up on it and just to have, you know, she was doing what the boys were doing. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander, right? So, that's, you know, you read about saying. Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones right. and all their kind. I think she was probably a lot nicer to her lovers and her groupies <laughs> than those dudes were. <laughs> that's a great point. And it would be a double standard to judge her for something that the guys were doing. And, you know, uh, I did feel at points like I was reading an alternate version of On the Road with the mm. traveling, the going here, there. It wasn't always clear why it was happening. There was just all the slingshot activity. And sometimes mm -hmm. the point just seemed to be going somewhere. Yeah. You know? Well, having adventures and, you know, I think some of her adventures didn't, she, again, if she'd only lived, I think she would have, she wrote some very cool songs and I think she would have continued on as a songwriter and a lot of her songs, I mean, of course, the early ones, some were inspired by Bessie Smith songs and stuff, but she was writing about these things that she was experiencing and this kind of gypsy lifestyle and all that. But then the interesting thing about Janice is she was so complex because at the same time, she wanted a home. She loved her house that she bought in Marin County in Larkspur. She spent all this time, you know, fixing it up. She apparently, her friends that I got to interview, whenever she was in a hotel room on the road, even, you know, the Chelsea Hotel, she spent a lot of time there, but even like the one night stand hotel rooms, she'd fix them all up and put the scarves around. And she'd always create a sense of aesthetics and visuals mm. for wherever she was to make it homey for her. And, um, you know, she also still had embedded in her psyche at that point when she died, this like need for a husband, a family, you know, kids, the white picket fence and all that kind of stuff that a good girl growing up in the 50s was conditioned to want. She still wanted that stuff, even though she loved the crazy hedonistic lifestyle, too. Uh, there's a question from somebody, who, uh, Treva, as a matter of fact. Where did Janice get her inspiration for fashion and dress style? Was she influenced by anyone in particular or was it her own creation? Well, I think originally, um, as far as the way, you know, the Janice that we know and the wild clothes and stuff, um, I think the first inklings of that look came from Bessie Smith, who was incredible, these outfits that she would wear, and Ma Rainey, the Empress of the Blues, uh, very royal, you know, and of course from the 20s, amazing, that kind of um, great flappery look and all that stuff. Um, before Janice was became the queen of the counterculture with the look she concocted she very much was inspired by the bob dylan kind of beatnik look you know so you see early pictures of her and it's nothing like the way she looked later on but um she was there at a time when all these cool people in san francisco were raiding thrift shops and junk stores and finding cool vintage clothes from the 20s and um, kind of repurposing them and making cool outfits. Um, there was a whole love of exotic, um, you know, garments from other cultures, from Morocco, from Mexico, from India. So she loved all that. Before she had any money, she was literally making like tops out of like lace tablecloths and, you know, um, different hippie girls that were her friends would help her sew outfits. But then once she had the money to buy really cool stuff, she had a woman named Linda Gravenitis, who was a dear, dear friend of hers, her roommate. And Linda was a really great designer. And so she designed and made a lot of her really famous outfits that you've seen in photos and stuff. And then um, there were a few other women that made her clothes as well. Um, you know, we talked about her influences. What about people she's influenced? Who in subsequent to her death and up to the present day uh, are some familiar names 
well, that had pulled influence from her. Well, it's really cool that a lot of men and women have been influenced by her uh, vocally. You'd have to look at Robert Plant, even some of the hard rock singers like Axl Rose, uh, Steven Tyler, huge fan of Janice's. Um, and a picture was found of him reading my book, I'm happy to say. <laughs> um, but in fact, I, you know, and when that went up on Facebook and went viral, I heard from all these people like, oh, yeah, I closed, I worked at Trash and Vaudeville and took Steven Tyler shopping one time, a private shopping trip, and he was wearing a Janice t-shirt. So a lot of those guys loved her, loved her style. Lenny Kay told me, you know, he would trap David Johansson, New York Dolls. So a lot of uh, male singers very much inspired by her sound and her you know, even her style with the microphone and the scarves and all that stuff. Um, as far as women go, I think she has been influential in many, many ways. A uh, few women uh, vocally, but a lot of them, I think, have just been so motivated to um, be vulnerable, to expose their inner feelings through their music. Uh, even, you know, people like Alicia Keys has talked about that. Uh, people like Pink, um, you know, so, um, Joan Osborne told me when she was first uh, singing bluesy kind of stuff, you know, out of Kentucky, you know, Janice was an influence, um, you know, so many people. And then I think even uh, like Roseanne Cash, you would never think about, but she oh. told me she, Janice was a huge influence on her. Um, so I think in, in so many ways, both um, just her musicianship, her lifestyle, her strength, her fearlessness, but at the same time, her willing uh, willingness to show vulnerability through her singing influenced yeah. a lot of women. Yeah. You know, this is like uh, asking you to be a prognosticator. But had she lived, what do you think she would have done? One idea oh, I had. I'm all over that, that question. I like being okay. a prognosticator, Park. Go for it. Number one, she would have definitely become a producer, one of the first mm -hmm. female producers. In fact, um, I did interview people that she was all excited because Paul Rothschild did say, you got to, you should be producing. So I think she would have done that. I think, um, you know, she loved Nina Simone and, you know, Nina Simone, <laughs> she does not like many artists, <laughs> but there's a couple of her live recordings at Montro where you can hear Nina Simone talking about the great Janis Joplin and how much she liked her version of when, you know, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. So I, she was, Janice was taking piano lessons when she died. I mean, the woman never rested on her laurel. She was always reaching. So I think she would have done like a, at some point, kind of a, you know, piano blues record even. Uh, definitely, I think her next album after Pearl would have been a whole album of kind of country rock stuff. She was mm -hmm. kind of getting back to her Texas roots and she was loved Chris Christopherson. And I saw somebody wrote a question about that. Not only did she have a relationship, she had a, she took him to bed, baby. <laughs> she <laughs> loved that guy. He was hot, but she, more than anything, she loved his songwriting, loved it. There's a bootleg of her doing a Sunday morning coming down that's just heartbreaking. And people don't realize that she learned uh, me and Bobby McGee um, back in 69, even when she was with the Cosmic Blues Band and actually played it for the first time in Nashville at a concert there and said, nobody's heard of this guy, but y'all are gonna hear of him. His name is Chris Christopherson. He is the best songwriter. She really saw him as like Dylan, but in the kind of, you know, country Texas uh, trappings. And she loved that because she never lost that Texas thing. And she grew up, you know, in, in Austin, she was singing Kitty Wells songs and Rose Maddox songs. Uh, she loved Hank Williams. Uh, Jolie Blanc, the guy who wrote that song was, you know, Cajun music was from Port Arthur. So I think she would have definitely done an album that would have fit right in with, you know, GP and uh, Grievous Angel, um, that kind of sound, you know, um, and then, but I don't think she would have ever stuck with one style. I think she would, she was just, you know, a voracious omnivore when it came to music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think eventually she might have done an acoustic album, gone back to her acoustic oh, yeah. roots because, you know, Big Brother was the first time she played in front of a band with electric instrumentation. Yeah. Which is another thing I learned in your book that kind of took me aback. Yeah, you know? if you want to go down the YouTube rabbit hole, you can hear a lot of her acoustic music um, from the early 60s. 
both performing in 1962 in Austin, Texas, and then also 63, 64 in San Francisco when she was uh, doing the blues circuit, but, you know, doing some folk songs as long as well as the blues stuff, even some kind of Dixieland stuff. She wrote mm -hmm. this song called Mary Jane that, mm -hmm. you know, it's a song about weed. And since it is 420, hey, we got to talk about weed. Now, Janice herself was not really a huge pothead. She smoked mm -hmm. it up until it got really strong. I don't think she liked it anymore. But, you know, she, she, smoked, it when, she smoked it when it was really hard to find um, when she actually first hitchhiked to San Francisco when she was 18 years old from Los Angeles and um, in LA, she lived in Venice Beach and she first, you know, started smoking weed there and got some in San Francisco. And um, when she was there in 63, 64, she was mainly, you know, a pill popper. She liked speed and that's when horribly she got addicted to crystal meth. But she did occasionally smoke weed and she wrote this really great song called Mary Jane that literally sounds like it's from the twenties, like a hokum blues and this Dixieland band back of really established musicians in San Francisco did recordings with her of that song and some other ones in like 64. You can hear that stuff on YouTube. Yeah, she really did have a broader palette of musical styles than oh. the recorded evidence would, would yeah. show. You can hear hints of it. And, and I, one of my other goals was I was always brought up to believe by reading Rolling Stone and everything that her first solo album, I got them all cosmic blues again, mama sucked. It's a freaking phenomenal record. It's got amazing stuff. It really shows her diversity as an artist because she's doing all kinds of songs on there, you know, like standards, you know, the Nina Simone, the, um, you know, blues, some original songs she wrote is you can really see all the different styles. And there, I found after the book came out this incredible interview that uh, she did that had just only been recently digitized with Studs Terkel back mm -hmm. in 68. And she was just talking shop with him about musicianship and how someday she'd love to be able to develop her singing to the point where she could have the kind of nuance of a Billie Holiday with that. And, you know, she knew her limitations and she wanted to continue to expand her musicianship. I think, you know, she took guitar lessons um, even in 63, 64. She bought a double, she bought a 12 string guitar and was playing 12 string guitar. I mean, 12 like string guitars belly. are not that easy to play, I can tell yeah. you. She That would have been a lead belly kind of a nod to lead belly, who was another mm -hmm. one of her early primary influences. Definitely, um, yeah. And, and I was also struck by the fact that her creativity went beyond music. She seemed to be mm -hmm. into everything from interior decorating to clothing to bead making to, you know, it, it really did seem to spill over into areas other than music. Yeah, well, up through her first couple of years in college, you know, she kind of wanted to be like a female Modigliani. She was a painter, um, you know, her parents recognized her talent as a visual artist, you know, really quite young. And so she started getting art lessons even as a kid. And, you know, I've seen a bunch of her paintings and drawings and she definitely had talent in that direction. But um, when she discovered music and what she would get, I think particularly that feedback from audiences and also just how it was such a great um, medium for her to express all this angst. And, you know, she was a very sensitive person. She did have a lot of like pent up emotion and angst and hurt and, she realized that it was much uh, better for her to get that out through singing than through painting, you know. I also like the way she would just, if she felt a situation was wrong, she would pounce on that person. She would not hold back. She was, she was a provocateur in a lot of ways. Oh, and yeah. A, a really strong-willed, um, strong sense of right and wrong and... Would. Yeah, you can see her, you know, that's why I really wanted to get as much information as I could about her childhood, because you could see these personality traits in her, even as a little girl that would play out in her life. I mean, she was a tomboy. Um, her, she, you know, was an only child until she was six. 
her dad apparently really wanted a son. So because he had this daughter, he built all this like really dangerous playground equipment for her. He would take her with him to the barber shop and she'd get her bangs cut there. You know, she really was treated like with equal rights. She wasn't treated like the little girl and given doll. She was treated um, kind of um, with non-gender, I guess, really. And um, she was also taught to speak her mind. She was taught to read books and question things. And interestingly, even though her mom was pretty much kind of a, you know, she both of her parents came from very, uh, you know, uh, not I wouldn't say totally impoverished, but barely scraping by backgrounds. They came of age in West Texas during the Dust Bowl, Great Depression. So they didn't have a lot of uh, financial security. They, um, the mother particularly came from a very broken home, became like the gossip, her family. So her mother, you know, parents want the be best for their kids. So her mom really wanted her to have the stable, you know, middle-class life and really tried to make that happen for her, for her. Her father, on the other hand, was kind of an outlier. He was an atheist in the small Southern town, which was kind of unheard of in the fifties. He listened to, he worked at Texaco and mid -man middle management, but he would come home and listen to classical music and play these heavy duty. I mean, listen to like Bach and Beethoven. And then he would read these heavy duty volumes on world history and you know all this stuff he was Janice called him a secret intellectual so I think you know all these kind of things really made her who she was hmm. Hmm. last question and it's kind of a meta question what was going on in that time because it wasn't just Janice it was uh Brian Jones died in quick succession Brian Jones um Jimi Hendrix Janice Joplin Jim Morrison and there were others as well. Alan yeah, the Wilson. Guy from, Canned Heat. Yeah, Mike Bloomfield later, a guy from Mike. Canned Heat. Um, yeah, a lot of people. Nancy Gurley died of a, a heroin overdose administered yeah. by her husband. Um, yeah, and in fact, Janice paid for, um, San, uh, for James Gurley's legal defense when he was charged with manslaughter because he shot her up. Yeah. You just got the sense if they could have survived this, whatever was going on, it was like this orgy of self-obliteration that was mm -hmm. happening. And if they could have just survived that, you know, we might still have some of them with us now. Yeah. If only everyone could have Keith Richards' genes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the secret. That's the secret. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have any other questions? Oh, who in the world, historical or contemporary, would Holly like to do a biography on now? Well, do you guys want late breaking news? <laughs> well, I don't want to jinx it. I mean, it might not happen, but um, I have a book proposal for a new biography with two major publishers. <gasps> they just got them yesterday. So maybe this will be my good luck charm, guys. And guess what? It's all thanks to Janis Joplin. Um, uh -huh. One of Janis's biggest influences who I wrote about in the book, uh, the executor of the literary estate of that person read that and then remembered that back at my Rolling Stone days, this little book that Park contributed to called the Rolling Stone Book of the Beats, he recalled about that book um, because this is a younger member of um, this literary figures family who has taken over the estate because his uncle who ran it passed away a few years ago. And this guy is cool and used to play in bands and all this stuff. And he remembered that book. And um, they said, Holly, would you want to write a biography where we give you all access to all the archives, everything, and you can quote from all the unpublished manuscripts, all the letters, the journals, and we won't tell you what to write. You have complete autonomy independence. and independence. It's the biography of Jack Kerouac. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, Although <laughs> my. <laughs> so, That's yeah. So, something. And here you so told me, after you finished Janice, you said, you're <laughs> like, I don't know if I can do another book. <laughs> I know, right? That right. just goes to show you never say never. In fact, I just ran into someone the other day and I mentioned to her, like, she's like, what are you doing? I was finishing up this book proposal. And she said, but wait a minute. You said that you were just going to have an Airbnb and that's all you were going <laughs> to do. <laughs> but sadly, you know, I couldn't pass up this opportunity. And I know 
when if if I if this book deal comes to pass, probably two years from now, I will be pulling my hair out, screaming, "Why? Why did I do it? Why?" Because it's going to be a challenge. I mean, mm-hmm. especially looking at a guy like Kerouac, who I grew up idolizing and loving his books, but now when we look at him through the cultural lens we're now living in and some, you know, it's, there's going to be some difficult uh, things to examine in his life that are not so pleasant, you know, and Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. so it's Mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy, but it will be very cool. So I'm hoping it works out. So fingers crossed. My fingers are crossed for you. And I'll get to come to North Carolina because he used to come down to live in Rocky Mount and Kinston. And he even wrote one of his books that's, I think, out of print now. (laughs) One of the ones that would probably be uh, looked down upon to this day. Um, That pick? Yes. Hmm. Although I just read that Tom Waits said pick was his favorite Jack Kerouac book. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway. All right. Well, somebody Thank says you can you do it, Holly. There you. you go. Oh, somebody asked about what of Janice's songs might sum up her story. I highly recommend. I on a crusade for everybody to listen to. I got them old Cosmic Blues again, Mama, because yeah. it was so disparaged by the boys' club at all the rock scenes when it came out in 1969. And um, she does. There's a song on there that she wrote called Cosmic Blues, which is just killer, and it kind of explains her own um, philosophy of life that she learned from her father, sadly, this thing he called the Saturday night swindle. And basically in a nutshell was no matter how hard you work and how hard you try and you do everything right, you're still gonna get knocked down. Life has got a way of punching you in the face, kicking you in the gut. And the Saturday night swindle idea, like, yeah, you can go out and have fun on Saturday night, but the next day you're going to wake up with a hangover and then you're going to have to go back to work the next day. So that was this kind of black dog of, you know, depression um, and just waiting for the next shoe to drop anxiety of what's bad's going to happen next, which really sadly was part of Janice's psyche. But she wrote this incredibly gorgeous song um, that I love that's on that album. So check that one out. This, well, I think I, it I'm, I'm, up I'm glad you have uh, done a reclamation project in Cosmic Blues because I always thought it was underrated. And just because, yeah. you know, an influ- back then, an influential review in a place like Rolling Stone, a pan, could yeah. get picked up on and echoed. And then yeah. that became you know, that became everyone's opinion of it, right or wrong. Oh yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Like, you know, newspapers back then, well, just like now, (laughs) they didn't have music critics, Um, you know. It was before we had all these great music writers who had jobs in the newspaper world. (laughs) Now it's back to the way it was in the 60s again. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, that's another topic. Oh, how large was the UNC crowd for her concert? And John, you have to see if you can remember how many people there. I just have to tell you one quick little thing. When I was in Chapel Hill, I I meant to invite Steve Weiss today, the wonderful guy that runs the incredible Southern Folklife Collection at Wilson Library, um, invited me to give a talk on my Alex Chilton book when that came out which believe it or not, I found ancestral letters from Alex Chilton's family at the Wilson Library collection, unbelievable. (laughs) But anyway, um, at that event, which was great, and Stephanie was there, if she's still here, um, afterwards a woman came up to me because I had gotten the book deal for Janice and said, oh my gosh, I was at the Janice show in Chapel Hill. She was so amazing. And after the show, and John, I'm not sure if it was at the venue or if it was at the you know the the door the um, house yeah but she had a bottle of wine she was passing around everybody and this woman said to me um she goes oh janice i'm so glad to meet you so many people tell me i look like you and she goes honey i feel sorry for you i hope you're getting laid more than i am or something i mean the woman remembered it so crystal clear so i'm saying can you hear me Yes. yes. Yeah. Because uh, one last question, just interested in how you think uh, your time undergrad days in Chapel Hill sort of planted the seeds to where you've come. Definitely the music thing. Um, as I said, I grew up in Ashburn, North Carolina, although now I've found out there was all this amazing stuff. I could have seen Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner and Elvis and all these people that I wasn't 
smart enough to go see at the day, but you know, being the older of three kids, I didn't have a big sibling to turn me on to cool concerts. Although I did see the Jackson Five in 1960, no, no, 1970 at Greensboro Coliseum and James Taylor at the Greensboro Coliseum. But Chapel Hill was where I really got to experience music. Um, even when I was still in high school, I went to Chapel Hill. I saw B.B. King there in 72. Um, I saw Linda Ronstadt. I saw Fleetwood Mac. Um, you know, I saw all these amazing shows there. But then also I started going out to clubs all the time, you know, like the Cat's Cradle, mm -hmm. um, you know, all these cool places. And I got to experience live music. So even though I was this diehard fan from listening to the radio obsessively beginning in third grade, like AM radio, in Chapel Hill, I got to listen. We had a great radio station, campus radio station. Um, FM was coming in then in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. So th I think it really um, made music seem possible for me as being kind of not just something I was into, but I could actually write about music. Um, I started writing for a fanzine when I was in Chapel Hill and just getting to meet all these people also from all over, um, you know, really opened my mind. Although I still like to tell people I was still kind of, I had one leg and hip, wanting to be a hippie and one leg and wanting to be a punk rocker because um, by my final time there in Chapel Hill, I had met um, a guy, I'd become a huge fan of a band out of Raleigh called The Cigarettes which was like the one and only punk band in North Carolina in 1978. And um, the drummer became my boyfriend. So um, that's how I actually ended up hitching a ride with them to New York City in 1979. But at that point, um, I was still, before I met him, I was still torn. Like I want to either move to New York City and make it as a writer and do music and all that stuff, or move to Key West where I can go to sunset every night and where the you know, hippies are out playing their bongos, <laughs> acoustic guitars and stuff. Cause I used to go to Key West from Chapel Hill during spring break, you know? So, um, so anyway, New York won out fortunately, although I did go back to Key West recently and I loved being there again. So maybe I can go there for that. Um, they have a great writers conference there. Uh, I think Erica Jong, I think it is the person that has that in January. So maybe I can do both. <laughs> Well, we were we were very blessed in the seventies, the late sixties and seventies, my time there, and uh, people like uh, Don Dixon, Arrogance, and of course the Red Clay Ramblers, Jim Wan, oh, yeah. Bland Simpson, who is a creative writing professor in more recent years. Yes, but there's such a heritage and. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful to see the expansion of the heritage on the sort of uh, writing side of uh, the rock and music industry. And, totally. Uh, and we're blessed having both of you tonight. Thank you so much. We could go on and on. And I Indeed. want to give a special thanks, a special shout out to Dave German because He's the guy that um, sought me out and got in touch with me. And it turns out, again, crazily enough, he knew uh, my roommate in, in New York City when I moved to New York. And um, we were living together and she knew I was a huge fan of Graham Parker, who I who literally I've become friends with because he ended up moving up here in the Woodstock area where I live in upstate New York. But I loved his album, Squeezing Out Sparks, still one of my top 10 favorite albums of all time. And Dave worked at his record label and I think invited Pam to go, but she couldn't. So I got to go to see this incredible concert with great seats at the Palladium on 14th Street, which sadly no longer exists in New York City. So, and Dave brought this me to this. So I'm so thankful to him. So thank you, Dave. <laughs> thank you so much, Holly. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming and I hope we can, maybe we can do this again. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks everybody. On the road. Oh, I just see my brother who's in Ashboro now came in tonight <laughs> and knows Park, my brother Owen. So he went to NC State, but don't hold that against him. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Park. Yes. Thank you, Dave. Thanks you everybody. Thanks, thanks, Paul. My pleasure. Great. Thanks for coming. See you, Holly.